welcome to episode three of Just Branding. We are going to be talking about what design, designers need most when it comes to brand strategy and some of the tools that you can use to facilitate strategy. And it can be pretty overwhelming when you start first start in strategy to figure out what it is, what to use and how to facil facilitate it. And I, I went through this process, so I'd love to share what I've learned and some of the tools that I've um, I use in my process and I've actually taken a lot of courses, read a lot of books and I've, I've taken bits and pieces from all of these courses to, to really create my own process. And Matt is going to share his um, point of view and his tools as well, some of his, um, yeah, some of his tools to facilitate strategy. And I, I'm going to start off with my, my favorite uh, course that I took and it was called Brand Master Secrets. And the reason I, I love this course is because it actually taught all the thinking behind strategy rather than just um, the, how to um, do strategies, the thinking behind it. And that's really what got me into the better headspace, headspace for conducting strategy sessions and just gave me a broader um, picture of strategy. And I've taken many others. I'm going to name them because they're, they're, you can research them yourself and to see what you uh, resonates best with you. So I've taken eResonate, which is from Fabian Geihelter. Uh, I've done an um, interview with him. I've taken his course and it, it's kind of a condensed version. Uh, it's really great to, to see how he's distilled down strategy into what he does in like one day. And uh, some people may not agree with that, but he's, that works for him. And that's really what strategy is about, what works for you what works for your client and um, your process. So that's one. Um, another popular one is Core from the Future. And this is more about facilitating strategy. Um, it can get quite in depth. They also have a light version. Um, there is um, Story Brand, which is more of a marketing course, but I really love Story Brand as well because it, it, it put the customer as the hero and really taught you how to um, um, message to them in a very easy way and it kind of comes down back to simplifying your message and I, I found that very fascinating um, so it's story brand by Donald Miller and he has a book and a course and he also has an online university so there's some tools that um, I've explored there's um, there's also um, another course um, activate your strategic brain by Steph Hamnelik which I've also taken uh, so as you can see, there's a lot out there and it's really about doing the research on what's right for you. I've actually compiled all of these into a blog post on, on my site as well, if you're interested to learn more. So uh, nice little sneaky plug there, but it's, it's super useful to know what's out there so you can actually make educated decision to, to help you build your own process. So that's, that's uh, kind of where I've come from. And I've used bits and pieces from all of these and put them into what works for me and how I sell it through to the client as well. Because uh, you'll find that pieces from each toolkit or each course or each book won't actually work for you and your process. So it's about doing what's right for you and experimenting, improving your process and so forth. So Matt's been doing this for a long time and he can <laughs> share his um, distill down I'm not sure if you do it in a day, but uh, what's your process I can, look like I these days? I've, I've been asked by some clients to do stuff in afternoons, which is just bonkers. But the so for me, um, you talked about sort of your background and you've explored some of these courses. I explored strategy mainly through a lot of reading of books, right? <laughs> so um, for me, some of the best books were written by Marty Neumeier, right? So if, you, um, if, you, if you're into looking at this, have a look at, say, some of... Oh, let me just have a quick look. We've got, like, The Brand Gap, The Brand Flip, and Zag. We can put links to all these uh, uh, below. You definitely want to fill your head with that stuff. I found Marty's thinking fantastic, but any book by David Arker or even Seth Godin um, is fantastic. Um, so I read a lot of books um, and I still am reading lots and lots of books and, and uh, I can't sort of recommend that enough. So that's so rather than doing the courses, I kind of went more down the, the reading route. But I did do a course um, by Marty called Level C um, and there's different tiers and I was um, one of the first to be qualified into tier one, which is awesome. So 
um, you can have a look at level C and we can put a link on for that. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely worth, you know, experiencing somebody else's approach as well as doing your own. Um, but like you, Jacob, like I don't, um, I think the thing to think about is it can be really overwhelming with strategy. Like what do I put in? What do I not put in? And for me, I've always gone down the approach of not having like a solid, stringent kind of um, step by step thing. Now, I know I say that slightly hypocritically because I also have a book called Storyatogy, which goes through um, various steps that you can go through. But that doesn't mean people say to me, Matt, like, do you always do that? And the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is because no business is, is, is the same, right? Not one business is the same. And the reason that that's the case is because the people running the business are all different. And there's so many different dynamics, so many different um, things to think about. There's different markets they're playing with. There's different company setups and there's different personalities around the boardroom table. So when you put all of that together, every single situation that I've been in from a strategic perspective over the last 10 years has been very, very different. Um, and so you can never, anyone that, in my view that says there's, a, there's, there's this one way of doing it, um, I would very much treat that with a little bit of suspicion. So what I do instead is if someone comes to me, I get to know their context, get to know their situation. Um, what is it they want to change? What is it they need to know? Is it, is it they want to stand out in the market? Is it that they want to unify their team? Is it that they just don't, they just don't have clarity? What is it that they need? And then I ask about all the different personalities. I ask about the leadership team. I might even do some research. And then I will go back into my toolbox, my brand's toolbox, right? And pull out the exercises and the key things that I think that they need, depending on the time I have with them. So like you said, um, do you do a day? Yeah, I do a day. But what do I put in that day? Well, it depends what the, what they really, what the customer needs and what where I can add most value. So that's kind of my approach, which is, Probably not what people want to hear. They want to hear like a, there's a magic bullet that you press a button and suddenly like all this strategy stuff tumbles out. The truth is it's quite a messy creative process. Um, and we were talking just before we, we sort of hit record. And um, one of the things that I think um, is worth saying is that that's where the facilitator, the strategist, the creative brain powerhouse or whatever you want to call it that pulls everything together is really, really important because a business might respond really well to me um in a certain circumstance because i have that personality and the beard and the whole british thing going on but in another you know another business might actually that might actually be really awful for them because they're all i don't know that they're, they're just it's a personality thing people buy people so i think you've got to make sure that if you're going into strategy you kind of start to know the types of people that want to work with you and you want to work with and you know aim everything towards them so for me i often work very well if i've got a maverick ceo who wants to change things who um who wants to do it well and wants to do it right and is you know they value things like being polite and a little bit of humor but not too much humor um, and it's getting those types of people is, is my audience so i don't know about you jacob if there's um, anything you wanted to add to that but that's kind of my uh, my approach. So you're saying the secret to strategy is a, a beard. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> yeah, that is it. That's the magic bullet. Maybe, maybe that's it. I should, uh, I should bottle that and sell yeah. it. But no, I mean, having, having said that there's not kind of like one way, there are definitely some, some things that I would typically always do no matter what type of uh, client um, there was. So, it, it might be worth just kind of going through some of the, is it worth that going through some of the cool stuff that we think is most ad, has added the most value over the years to clients? Would that be useful? Yeah, I think so. Um, but before we do, I was going to just highlight a few of the things you said while you were speaking. And uh, okay. what you, the first section was aligning to their goals. Uh, you, you mentioned about getting leadership on board and getting them clarified and it does come back to what they're trying to achieve. So that is what is going to help you dictate or help you construct your process is the goals of the, the business. And like you said, coming back to that toolbox and picking and choosing what actually works for you. And that's why having a broad uh, knowledge of strategy is so useful. 
because um, yeah. you can actually grab these bits and pieces like I have done from all these different courses and books and put them together and uh, into a process that works for you. And you mentioned Messy. It is an extremely messy book, um, messy process. And it kind of got me thinking on the, the line of Marty's book, Scramble, and how they've yeah. kind of scrambled together. And uh, if anyone hasn't read it, it's about... Um, it's about um, trying to save a company that's going under within five weeks. So they scramble together to try to save the company. It's kind of like a, a business thriller and they go through that process. It's a very messy process and this facilita facilitator comes in and helps them to, to achieve this, um, this goal. So that's really what we do as strategists is to, to facilitate. And um, yeah, that's why we're seen as a consultant and that's really why I'm a, um, a, a big believer in designers actually become a strategist because then they be, they can help consult to the client versus taking orders from the client and just doing what they ask. So that's really why you're you're paid for your thinking versus just your execution. So yeah, people buy people, and yeah, also bids. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think that is the thing. It's um, you know, this this particular episode is on on what designers need to know most. Um, and I think that is probably one of the reasons I've sort of shifted away from designing, if that makes sense, because I feel that as you start playing in the strategy space and if you kind of start to enjoy it and you start to be able to make a, a huge difference to a business rather than just, as you say, the execution, now you're suddenly playing at the top table. You know, you're maybe working. I mean, some of my work, I was so shocked, started to be work used in HR teams and product innovation teams. Um, and suddenly you're like, hey, I'm not really doing any design anymore. Um, and when you go into that space, it's so much better to position yourself as a consultant, as somebody who's going to advise the client through a series, through, over a period of time to really change, make a change um, in the business that, 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 that they might need, as opposed to let's just do a poster. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself um, because still, even if you find yourself in that place, You've still got to execute on that. You've still got to have designers. You've still got to have creatives who need, need certain bits of information to produce work that really kind of blows people away. And that's what this episode's about. So where were we? Values? <laughs> we're going to get into the values of... Yeah, so, so shall, I, um, shall I get cracking with some of, the, uh, some of the kind of cool tools that are, or, or exercises and, and outcomes that I think designers could really work with? For me, I think there's kind of like, I, I don't know what you think, Jacob, but I think there's maybe two sort of aspects. There's some real core basics that have to be in place that a leadership team really needs to kind of align around. But then um, there's the outworkings of those kind of core things. And there's, it's almost like a, uh, it's sort of a phased approach. So you can't really do the, when I say the outworkings, I'm talking about how those things might start to be portrayed, positioned in the marketplace, um, character traits, if you like. So there's these two sort of angles and these two bits, and they, they both go hand in hand. You've got the core. So when we talk about the core, I'm talking about, um, well, two main questions I think very helpful. Why do you exist beyond making money, right? And who do you exist to serve? They're the, the basics, the basic two questions. Um, and when we talk about why do you exist beyond making money, um, that is so hard sometimes because the answer to that might be different if you've never, if a leadership team's never got together, the answer for that might be different in, in everybody's heads. But what I always say to people is, look, if you know why you exist beyond making money, then when you stop making money, maybe you have a bad month, a bad quarter or whatever, you, you have a compelling reason to keep going. You know, your customers have a compelling reason to, um, if you've actually proved that, that you actually do exist, you know, for other reasons than making money, the customer will stick around. They're more loyal. They're more forgiving. Um, your people that could be the same. But if you've only ever gone on the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, the money, the problem is as soon as that's not there, you basically end your company, your company's game over. If you have something more compelling, you're more, you know, you're more stable and it gives you more of a, a meaning and reason for being. And the second thing is, is who do you exist to serve? Understanding that is crucial because 
the way that you serve that person today with the technology and the um the your abilities that are that you have at your disposal your resources if you know who your the type of customer the tribe you're trying to serve if you in in 10 years time the why the the, the the how you serve them will might change and adapt because their goals and challenges and needs might change as well so it means that with the answer to these two questions you can consistently keep adapting and changing and developing and innovating and creating solutions for your customer base um, in a way that if you don't have the answers to those questions you're just going to be knee-jerk reaction and just trying to do loads of loads of stuff all over the place so that's kind of <laughs> in a very high level they're the two kind of core things that i always look for and one other kind of thing that i tend to use is something i've sort of picked up from a few places it's called i call it the brand strategy triangle um and um you know jacob did a little plug to one of his posts i've I, you can look at that on my website um and it's it's all up there for free you can see what it is it's very simple it's basically a triangle um one triangle with another little triangle in the middle and in in each of the um Four, four triangles that that makes, there's uh, basically um, a, a word. So in the middle, you've got why. So that's your purpose beyond making money. Um, to one, one of the triangles to the side is, uh, is who, that's who you exist to serve. But there's two other different ones. There's the how. So how do you serve them? And that's where you can put your brand values and things like that. And, uh, and the what. And so having a very simple promise or even breaking that down into your various offerings is sometimes quite helpful. So in one kind of triangle, <laughs> you, you can sort of start to see what a brand is all about. And I sometimes spend a whole day, maybe even two days sometimes with some customers, some clients, helping them really fill in those four boxes, which sounds crazy, but when, um, when you've got different personalities in the room and different ideas, you need to spend a lot of time to iron those things out. So they're the core things. Jacob, what sort of core things do you like to use? Does that sort of cover the main ones or is there anything that you use that I've not mentioned there? Yeah, they're very similar overlaps. So I generally work on the internal aspects of the brand. So the purpose, the vision, mission, the values, and then yeah. that kind of directly feeds into where, where the comp company is going to be positioned. So looking at the competitors, what makes them different and yeah. the, the audience as well. So that is a, a key part of it. And I, I, I think that fits perfectly into your little triangle which is very on brand with my uh my background here so pink oh, <laughs> pink triangles i, I can i do like that <laughs> so yeah, yeah i think i no, think there is that's... sorry no sorry go on go on i um yeah yeah sorry. so the the positioning is a, a huge part of strategy and where a company is going to be positioned in the market is is directly going to um it be uh, it's going to um, it's going to directly affect how the company is going to look and feel in the marketplace, so how it's expressed. So that's that's really what these um, the core aspects of a brand is all about, and it's going to help um, the expression. Yeah, I think that's a good term, the brand expression. I mean, some of the other things that I I, I think is helpful to sort of as as I say, the expression is hand in hand with the core stuff, because one of the things you can start to do is really try and boil everything down um, into like a brand essence. I think that, you know, and, and what is that in a few words? What, what does this brand stand for? And I think really when you think about it, what we're looking at doing here is we're trying to simplify some, the complexity of a business so that it's an easily understood and executed idea, basically. That's all it is. So brand strategy is is trying to get a lot of people to execute a simple idea together in a unified way. Um, and if you do that right, that, that's brilliant. The, the, the aim for the, that's the aim for the company. The aim for the consumer and, and for, the, for its audience is to help them understand what this company is all about, to make their decision making so much easier so they know what to expect from this brand. They know um, what, um, what this brand will change within their lives, what this will make them become. So internally, it's around alignment. Externally, it's around decision making. That's how I see it, and differentiation. And what you've said about being different is, is absolutely crucial. Um, so when, um, when you do work on the expression, do you do anything around, um, how do you sort of approach the personality of the brand, the traits of the brand? And have you got any sort of thoughts on, 
on that because I think really from a designer's perspective, that's the bit that you need to start understanding to be able to put a font together, a set of colors, some imagery, some positioning. Um, it's, the, it's the expression of it, but you can't really get to that unless the core's been done. So how do you get to that? Yeah, so how do you, how do you bridge the gap between design and yeah. strategy? And I think, I think that's where designers will actually excel at, or, or at least good designers who have been doing it for a while, they'll, they'll understand how, how different traits are, are communicated in different typefaces, different colors, different looks and feels, white space, all the core design principles. And that is really where your design knowledge and your background can really come to fruition is to, to use all of those skills uh, to come back to the strategy that you put in place. So to bring this yeah. back home, uh, let's, let's use an example. And a, a good one is the luxury versus budget market. So if you think of um, high-end cars, for example, they have a different look and feel to um, say a budget, a budget car, which is much more friendly and approachable. It's for the everyday man, whereas the luxury car is very elitist and it's um, less approachable. It's all about the grandeur and the, the, the emotion behind it. Um, there's obviously emotion behind all, all these stories, but I, I think that's the, the luxury premium um, versus budget is one of those, um, those traits that everyone can relate to because the, everyone's exposed to these, these um, traits. So um, to put this in perspective, I, have, I do have a client example uh, who was a life coach who actually targeted high level executives and versus just like everyday, um, everyday people who were just trying to get by. So they were actually high level executives. So they needed an identity that directly communicated this high level aspect. So um, a lot of designers will realize that certain typefaces and le like letter spacing and, and overall like golds and blacks, for example, have a, a much more premium feel than like mm. a, a lowercase lettering and something that's blue and uh, I don't know, a little bit more approachable. It, they just have different feels. And if you have this essence to come back to and you know who your audience is, so high level executives, that is where the, the magic happens. And this is a very relatable brand, but uh, and it's very easy to think about kind of the luxury traits. But when you move into other traits, that's where it gets a little bit more challenging. So you have to come back, um, come back to the strategy and work on what the actual traits of the company are. Is it, um, I'm just thinking of other personality traits that can, you can kind of think of them as, as humans. Are they, are they wild? Are they um, organic? Are they vegan? Or whatever it may be, or <laughs> <laughs> whatever it, uh, the traits are, it, 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 you, it can be communicated visually. And it's not just visually, it's, it, there's so many other aspects to a brand that come to the forefront. Um, so the audio, for example, and um, touch, feel, mm. and all the sensory aspects, they, that's, that's what makes a brand and that's really what the strategy is about, to have that alignment for all these touch points, uh, not just the logo or the font and colors. So that's, that's really it in a crux. And if you go even deeper, there's there's other things. So um, how do people experience the brand? What events do you put on for them? Um, what uh, So you've got all the touch points, but then there's also you can start innovating new touch points, which can really add huge meaning to, to people. So, you know, I, I was working with a luxury kitchen showroom the other day. And one of the things we were talking about was um, they sort of they, they sort of have a franchise model. Um, and so they were like, "How do we, how do we, you know, up the standard of all our of all our franchisees?" So it was about, okay, well, we just need to get them all together, and we need to start offering training. We need to start wowing them. We need to start exciting them. We need to start sharing best practice across the different retail units. So suddenly, what turned into a brand discussion from what they were thinking, which was, you know, um, a look and feel, um, became more about actually making stuff happen that was going to be real and going to actually make a huge difference to them. And I think we were thinking about things like wine tasting events inside each showroom and then getting people to try it and then come back together and share, share the, the showrooms getting together and sharing what's worked and what's not worked um, from a sales perspective and, and adding huge value to the customer base who are looking for high end kitchens. So you're right. It's, it's about, um, the brand experience and how do we get onto that? So one of the tools I wanted to share was um, 
and we've touched on this in previous episodes, so I think it's probably worth covering off now, was this idea of archetypes. Um, so I use this loads. I find it really helpful when I'm working with creative teams. Um, they find it helpful. And then, our, you know, my customer, my basically leadership teams find it really interesting. And the reason why I think it works is because it aligns people on a very deep, meaningful sort of level. Um, and I mentioned it before, the book, um, if you're interested in reading about archetypes, is by Margaret Mark and Carol S. Pearson, and it's called The Hero and the Outlaw. And they go, basically, it was written around 2000, but the principles that they, they kind of tap into are timeless. And in fact, I think the idea of archetypes was originally defined by Carl Jung, at the break of the 19th century, right? So um, in a deep psychological kind of uh, connotations. And what Mark and Pearson discovered was brands that really embody these archetypes, these typical human patterns of behavior, um, really become, really resonate well within an audience. And so the audience understands what they're about and, um, and is attracted to them. Um, and so a lot of the leading brands in the world and really embody and, and live into this idea of an archetype. So if the leading brands are, and um, you know, and, and you're working with a brand, it, it makes sense to kind of do some research on that and see see what you can do. So what I tend to do, there's 12 character, character archetypes. And I say to people, look, once we understand who we serve, and we understand their story and what they're trying to change in their lives and why we as a brand can fit into that story, the customer's the hero, um, we fit in what part do we play and usually it's the part of um, you know the the, uh, the the ally the mentor the guide to the hero as the hero changes so we help them with a plan we help them with um, some tools with some ideas with some experiences we inspire them we push them forward but we still have to embody a personality that makes sense to the customer and, and, and is right for them so it, I sometimes give this example, right? If we were, if we were down uh, in a pub, in an Aussie pub, um, and somebody walked in and they were hilariously funny, we called Larry. We'd think, oh, Larry's great. He's a great entertainer-style person. We'd stereotype him as a bit of a joker, a bit of an entertainer, and we'd fall around laughing for hours. And if we were to go out next Friday and we wanted that kind of experience again, that entertainment, we might say, let's invite larry along for a pint right but if just creative wanted a new finance director perhaps larry wouldn't come to mind because instinctively we know that jokey people perhaps won't have their fingers on you know their, their brains on the money they won't be necessarily that organized just instinctively we might make that assumption and it's the same with brands. If we, if if somebody's sort of coming to us for a very serious, very very maybe intellectual knowledge that's going to give them stability, maybe a bank, for example, if you then positioned that brand in a jokey, jester-style, entertaining way with loads of jokes, and um, it may not resonate quite well, um, depending on the the audience type. It might be a way that you can differentiate. So you've got to be careful, but you need to think about the personality that you sh you show up with in your in your audience's story. So you've got to know who they are. Younger people might really love a, a bank that's a bit more jokey, but definitely sort of older people maybe trying to run a business or something, they, they might be really put off by that. So think about that. And archetypes basically are a way that you can do that. There's 12 of them. Um, which um, which I guess I could quickly run through, but I don't know if I, I don't want to bore everybody, but very quickly there's like the caregiver, the ruler, the creator, the sage, the explorer, the innocent, the magician, the rebel, the hero, and the jester that we mentioned, the lover and the citizen. There's tons of information about those on my website. Um, but basically in, in the simple form, they help you to manage meaning and personality if you can align you, you know yourself and your client around one of them and when you go to a creative team or designer you could say look we are the caregiver you know we're here to exist um to give care to our audience 
And the other cool thing about it is you can also then research other brands that are sort of playing in that archetypal space. They might not be in that marketplace. They not, might not be in that category, but it gives you another kind of rich source of research and inspiration that you can then tap into as a designer to apply to get that positioning, that, that sort of personality right for your current project. So I don't know, do, do you ever use them, uh, Jacob, or do you, do you find there's other sort of ways of, of getting traits or do you just kind of go down the traits routes? How do you sort of tend to work? Well, I came across brand archetypes probably a year or two ago and I was just blown away by it. And uh, I, I just think that the, the categorization can really help hone in on the personality type. So that does help. Um, I do personally find them a little bit fluffy at times and they, they, you have to do like just take them with a grain of salt and because as you said they you may you may differentiate yourself because uh, that's what works for your brand so um yeah i think they're a powerful tool if done correctly and it just helps you get uh, aligned in some some way but i i personally um try to think about brands as as more hu humans and try to just give them personality traits and really create uh, a persona around uh, say one or two ideal customers to to hone in on that versus just a, um, an archetype but that I found that as a, a useful tool in the beginning and I think what would be useful would be to provide some examples of uh, brands that people would know so you, you did uh, use lover for your furniture company but what would some other famous brands be that would people would realize they're a lover archetype and see how those kind of traits work together yeah sure so um i, do, I mean i've got to be careful because i'm over here in the uk so i might use some examples that are globally might not be um as well known but i don't know if you do you guys have um hagen dars over yeah. there which is like a, yeah. i think it's a german ice cream brand so if you look at any of hagen dars's sort of positioning from an ice cream perspective, obviously it's playing in more of a luxury, <laughs> luxury ice cream, if we can call it that, space, more premium product. Their whole positioning is around attraction um, and, um, and basically the love of brilliant ice cream, right? So, but it's positioned in a way of very lovers. So there's often lovers uh, depicted on their, on the, on the, on the, uh, on their advertising. Um, one advert I know goes, uh, it says like attraction can't be faked, neither can our strawberries, right? So they and they've got a picture of lovers together, like hugging. So that is a really interesting sort of positioning. They're selling ice cream, but they're basically saying, you know, we're not fake. Don't you, don't be fake in your loving relationships. And they're sort of tugging on that deep emotional pull from the customer, and but ultimately they're just selling ice cream. So have a look at Hagen Dars. Um, for for sort of a lover example um i suppose like other other sort of brands you think about let's talk about um let's talk about the explorer okay so the explorer archetype is all about uh taking people to new experiences but guiding and leading them to that new place the explorer never stands still the explorer is always looking to uh to, to, to take you to a destination and so when you think about brands that play in that space, um, the North Face is a really great example of that. So if you look at any of the North Face's advertising, their, their tagline is never stop exploring. And you never see a picture of, um, of somebody in an office in the North Face advert. Every time the North Face positions itself, it's always with someone like hiking up a mountain, swinging from a rock, something crazy like that. Why? Because they... Uh, have kind of started to embody this explorer archetype, which is all about taking you to a new place, taking you outside, taking you to a new destination. And people love it. Like we totally respond very, very well to that because it's very clear and that we, we attach to it on an instinctive, instinctive basis. So I don't know if, if, if that helps. You mentioned the everyday man or the, the sort of citizen sort of um, archetype. Um, and that's, interesting i'll give you one example from that so if you think about ikea um their kind of um strap line is the wonderful every day right so they're kind of positioning themselves to say look every every day is okay it's okay to just be normal like you're not going to save the world 
every day is 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 wonderful um and what they're trying to do is is say to you it's okay to be you just be you just perhaps in a bit more of an organized way but it's it's okay so they position themselves as everyday life mums and dads in homes we're just going to help you organize your stuff and that's that's literally it we're not going to save the world we're not taking you to a new destination we're not telling you to fall in love with our furniture what we're going to what we're here to do is be practical and realistic um but we're trying to do that in a bit of a stylish way but that's kind of a secondary thing we're here to celebrate the wonderful every day and i think that's a good example of of how they're embodying what we call the citizen uh, or the everyday guy gal kind of brand so does that kind of help i don't know if that kind of helps to illustrate some examples of yeah, for how sure. Could start that's, that's exactly what I wanted you to explain. And the, the few others that I think people would resonate with would be like Harley Davidson being the outlaw, for example, or yeah. uh, it's a, like the, the rebels. And that's, that's a really a, a very strong character trait that really hones in on that, that idea. So, um, yeah, we could explore, rebel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could really explore all, all of them. And, uh, but there, there's so much information out there about them and you can use that as, as a tool to to help create your um persona so yeah i think, I think, I think that's, that's the key thing isn't it like the archetypes are just a means to an end what's the end the end is to think about the brand as a person like you said sort of to start with um there's a lovely fancy word for that by the way anthropomorphosis which is i mean i don't even know how i said that but it's basically uh, the personification of of a brand and that's how consumers think of a uh, of a brand although it's a collective corporate of touch points of experiences of people of customer service people you know of of guarantees of products whatever it might be all of that just gets kind of pulled into one thing and ultimately we think of brands like we think of people so when you're looking at brand strategy look at that think about um, the traits, I think traits is a great thing to, to do. So sometimes I even have within a, per, uh, a brand um, archetype, I might work with a team to pull out the key traits. Like, I don't know, as you said at the beginning, sort of like friendly, powerful, um, you know, knowledgeable, whatever the trait is. Um, and then that is really, really helpful for a designer. So for me, when you when you go through all the strategy stuff the most helpful thing for a designer is those traits because then you can say to a designer look we're we're creating this brand that's going to be you know entertaining jovial um you know not take not too serious um, joyful whatever it might be now you've got some ideas to, to sort of go out and as you say you've got to accompany company that with the research on the competitors and you have to have done the core stuff but ultimately for a designer perhaps that's the most useful thing i don't know that that's a suggestion but um what do you think yeah i agree and you, often you'll ask clients like what are the, the core traits that you want to convey it's always professional trustworthy and uh like authoritative and it's like pretty much the the most vague words you could create or give a brand and of course everyone like every company wants to be professional and trustworthy that's that's the, the aim of branding uh, unless you're like a kid brand, for example, you may not want to be so professional. But the idea is that we're going to be, use these archetypes and these personality traits to to hone in on these um, these traits, actually, that you can use and put into a word that actually can help you design better. And that's really what it's all about, um, distilling these words down to these traits. One thing that I think is sometimes quite helpful, we've been looking at it from the client's perspective, um, if there's an opportunity in a project, one really useful thing to do is to flip it around and say, and do some research with their, if they're an existing company, do, do some research with their customers and ask them what kind of words come to mind when you think of company X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, and if, and if people struggle then to give them a list of like 50 words and say, just circle the four words that you think most, um, most resonate when you think of this company. Then that's interesting then because, and sometimes you can do both, do some with the leadership team, do some with your customer base, because then you can see if there's a gap between how people are perceiving you and where the leadership team think they are. Um, and then you can make some strategic decisions off the back of that. Do we approach, do we, do we, do we go into an unknown future or do we stay at what we are known at today? And these are 
these these can all come out of thinking about the trait of the brand how it wants to position itself how it wants to speak its tone of voice its look and feel its fonts its colors and all that stuff um but also right into the center of it its purpose and who it exists to serve so yeah that's it i think in essence i was, gonna, I was yeah i was going to actually use uh, mention another tool that i use it's uh i call, okay. I call it the brand personality matrix it's actually a free download um on my website you can go to brandinbriefcase.com and uh, you get a bunch of freebies and basically what it is is um, pretty much just a, 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 a sliding tool so if you imagine uh, feminine on the left and masculine on the right you, you can use the slider to go left or right and is this brand more masculine or is feminine and then you can actually go through um, this worksheet and choose different traits on either side and put where the balance is and that way you'll get to craft a, a, a certain personality and you can use that to to help your designs as well that's awesome thank you you're such a lovely man sharing all these things with the world jacob uh, plugs really plugs are. plugs <laughs> um well I, th I suppose i mean we've danced around quite a lot of stuff there i hope we've added some value to our customer uh, to our customers to our to our to our listeners i hope we've added some um some value to our listeners um inside there again you know we're, we're sort of trying to um really add some thoughts add some ideas to help designers make you know great great work um and i would sort of say that um that having listened to to you jacob and hopefully some of the things i've said i hope you can you can definitely uh, see the value of moving into that strategy space to be able to do that and uh, and so we i want to my party message is to encourage everybody to play with the strategy tools even if you start offering like a even a half hour phone call with your with your customers um for free to start with to sort of start dabbling with some of these things and ask them some of these questions you'll soon find the how 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 excited your customers get um with 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 you asking these types of questions and the and working with them on this type of thinking because they know um that your work is going to be even better as well uh, as well as you will know that so in encouragement to do that uh, good luck um and I, I guess we're probably best end this episode now so uh, i'll duck out jacob do you want to sort of end it with anything else uh, i think i just want to thank everyone for listening and staying with us uh, i know a lot of this can go over your head but it's uh, like matt said uh, it's it's we do encourage you to get involved with uh, strategy and explore the tools. And that, that's really what we want to achieve um, from this podcast and give you a little bit of insight from someone that has actually been doing this for a long time, as well as a designer that's in transition or is doing a bit of hybrid work. Uh, so you get a bit of uh, insight to both worlds. So uh, we also are curious to if you have questions, so hit us up on um, the socials or email send us your questions and we can even make it into an episode so we're really doing this for you so please get in touch with us we would really appreciate that and yeah reviews go a long way as well as social shares of course so yeah thank you so much <laughs>